All right, so today we're going to talk about cannabis and schizophrenia. Uh, people pay attention to cannabis talk these days. It's, it's all over everywhere in the news, and it's the subject of many state legislature deliberations, um, and is increasingly available as a legal substance, either for medicinal use or for purely recreational use. Um, so the question, though, the, the kind of niggling question is, uh, so it's a medicinal for all these things, does it have any side effects? As, as an aside, um, I recently reviewed the Ohio, the state of Ohio medical marijuana policy. Um, my state officially recognizes cannabis as a legitimate medicine uh, to effectively treat no less than 21 different diseases. Um, one medicine, 21 diseases, uh, it's got to be the most powerful substance on planet Earth. Um, and apparently, if I'm hearing the news right, um, is without side effect. So that, of course, was a little bit, I tried not to be snarky. I, I <laughs> said to myself I wasn't going to be sarcastic today. Um, but uh, nonetheless, if, if every medicine that I know of has side effects. Um, I assert that if something truly is medicinal, it becomes medicinal because it perturbs natural physiology, and when you perturb physiology at a population level, some people are going to um, find that unpleasant. Uh, so in fact, the, the, the most notable and the concerning one that we're gonna focus on in terms of cannabis risks uh, relates to psychosis, and we will examine the possibility that regular cannabis use can cause schizophrenia for a condition that looks a lot like schizophrenia. Um, the stage one, this should not be all that controversial of finding because any textbook of pharmacology from any point in the 20th century would say that acute paranoia or psychosis is well-known side effect for marijuana. Uh, in fact, many of the early marijuana legalization pioneers uh, later came to the attention of the news media because they were suffering from paranoia um, from their drug of choice. Um, every marijuana user from the 1970s was either had that experience themselves or knew somebody who had that experience. Um, this is not the least bit controversial. Um, and in fact, oh yeah, bullet point number three, there's, it seems like everybody is just fantastically excited about the therapeutic potential for cannabidiol, CBD. Uh, fun fact that the evidence for the, the rationale for studying CBD as a potential schizophrenia treatment um, rests in part on scientific rationale that when you give people THC, you make them paranoid, um, and the CBD can relieve that. So altogether, acute psychosis, acute paranoia, hallucinations of psychosis is not the least bit controversial. Um, the, the relationship that does rise to the level of some controversy these days is the one between cannabis and schizophrenia. So um, the non-controversial parts too, the widely accepted observations, are that people who regularly use cannabis wind up having a significantly higher risk of schizophrenia. Conversely, amongst people with schizophrenia, the prevalence of cannabis use far exceeds the prevalence of cannabis use you see in the general population. Um, the best epidemiology is converging around this figure of an odds ratio of three uh, for the increased risk of schizophrenia in regular cannabis users. And an odds ratio of three means that the odds of having schizophrenia if you're a regular cannabis user is three times higher than the odds of having schizophrenia if you are a non-user. So that's roughly saying that the risk increases by 300%. Um, this is not a controversial observation. In fact, the cannabis industry and cannabis advocates rarely even bother to dispute that fact. What they do dispute, um, and I would assert that they try to obfuscate, is uh, the assertion that this relationship is of any concern. Um, the, in other words, they will say that just because things are correlated, um, doesn't necessarily mean that one causes the other. There could be intermediary processes. Um, and of course, they argue this because it, open acknowledgement that um, this substance, which is increasingly legal um, as a medicinal aid or as a recreational tool, can increase the risk of schizophrenia by a factor of three, um, would be a significant impediment toward legal reform and from revenue. Um, so I think it's fair to, it's, it's, it's fair to be um, upfront about your conflicts of interest. <laughs> 
Uh, many promoters of cannabis have a direct conflict of interest. Um, I actually don't get paid for this. <laughs> so I'm just, uh, my interest is, is seeing people not get schizophrenia. Um, but it's a legitimate concern that, I mean, correlation doesn't imply causation. Nobody disputes that. Um, and this, this third bullet point, that maybe the direction of causality actually points the opposite way. Maybe there's a reverse causation bias at play. Um, is a valid argument. Uh, that argument goes that people who are genetically destined to get schizophrenia um, happen earlier in life to just make choices that lead to uh, greater greater exposure to cannabis, or that they have better better uh, results from cannabis so that they use it at higher rates. So this relationship is actually in some ways caused in reverse. Um, so we'll talk about those things in a second, but I just want to point out that for, uh, you know, for the true advocates, um, in my engagement with, with this group, it seems that the only acceptable evidence that they would accept is the study that you cannot do. Um, you know, the, they say, well, you can't, you can't trust that, you can't trust that, it's a good bias, bias, bias. In other words, all epidemiology is weak, no doubt. But um, the only way to definitely prove something in human beings is to do the study that's prohibited. Get a thousand teenagers, give 500 of them regular strength weed and have them smoke it for 10 years, and the other give them weed from which the THC has been removed and have them smoke it for 10 years, and then look and see who's gonna get schizophrenia. You know, you can't do that study, and you can't do that study for cigarettes either. Uh, in fact, they never did. They didn't get a thousand people and give one group tobacco and the other one group, and the other one placebo tobacco, and then who gets cancer? It's unethical, impossible. Yet, nobody doubts the relationship between smoking and cancer, um, and I'm going to try to suggest that we have the beginnings of the same kind of evidence uh, that should at least raise a great deal of concern. So if we can't do the let's cause schizophrenia study that I just described, um, what are we left with? Well, we can, we, can, we can look to see if there's a mechanism whereby cannabis or the active ingredients cannabis specifically are able to cause something like schizophrenia. Um, and we can see, you know, we can, we can evaluate the evidence for association. And if this really is um, more than just coincidental, we might expect to see some relationship between dose and effect. So the greater the exposure, the higher the risk, for example. Um, and, you know, as you can imagine, I'm going to show that all three of those conditions are met. So let's look at uh, mechanism. So how might uh, protracted cannabis exposure cause something that looks like schizophrenia? Well, first, cannabis, and specifically THC, um, well known to cause dopamine release. We see this in animal studies. We see this in human studies. In, in one experiment that was done, they were looking at dopamine receptor occupancy. A guy took a break from the PET scanning. Um, he came back and they found that his dopamine receptors were way less occupied than they were before. Um, they asked him, what happened during your break? Well, I smoked some weed. Uh, so he released a bunch of dopamine from his uh, cannabis and knocked off the experimental drug. Um, so, you know, a non-controversial statement, cannabis causes release of dopamine from the brain. Also not controversial because this has been shown both in animals and in humans, um, THC, will suppress levels of our body's endogenous cannabinoid, which is called anandamide. Um, in the brain, anandamide it appears to be very important in protecting the brain against uh, inflammatory insult. Uh, so, um, the, so that's a problem, as I'll say in a swell. The problem with that, let me, let me summarize the significance of dopamine. Everybody knows, we talked about it in like lecture two this round, that um, dopamine excess release is a pathway to psychosis and persistent dopamine release is a pathway to schizophrenia. Uh, we've also talked about the inflammatory hypothesis. Inflammation in the brain can produce something that looks like schizophrenia psychosis. So if, we're, if cannabis can suppress the brain's endogenous anti-inflammatory compound, this is a recipe for setting the brain up for inflammatory insult, and then ultimately psychosis potentially could arise from that. So those are mechanisms. Uh, we also know from the observations, uh, again, from the last hundred years, that uh, some marijuana smokers will suffer acute psychosis with um, acute exposure. And every psychiatrist knows that the more episodes of psychosis a person experiences, the more likely that becomes a bigger problem later on. In neurology, we call it kindling. Um, and in psychiatry, we don't really have a name for it other than that psychosis appears to be somehow neurotoxic, which makes more psychosis likely. So um, we have enough 
to begin to explain how this relationship might exist. Uh, if you want further, then we have these studies uh, showing that cannabis can cause excessive dopamine release. Um, in like chapter three of this round of SE consult, we talked about glutamate psychosis. Um, can cannabis actually then affects glutamate signaling? Um, and, it, and by virtue of interacting with CB receptors, um, can uh, skew the brain maturation. So, you know, mechanisms exist, is the point of that. Oh, one more point of mechanism. Um, this relates to the dopamine theory. Um, this is a really interesting study, and it should you know, raise some eyebrows. Um, in this study, they looked at a large number of youth. Um, and they, they, no, I'm sorry, they looked at a large number of adults with schizophrenia. And they asked, were you a, a cannabis user before the age of uh, 15 to 18? And so they parsed cannabis users in the dark black bars uh, versus cannabis abstainers in the gray bars. Um, here we see, and on the y-axis, we see the prevalence of uh, schizophrenia-like diagnosis as an adult. Now, the x-axis shows the genotype at an enzyme called COMT. Uh, COMT stands for catechol o methyltransferase um, As the name implies, it's important in the oxidation or the metabolism of catecholamines, notably of dopamine. Um, at CUMT, there's this one um, genetic locus in which a person can be born with methionine at a certain position in the protein or valine. Um, and so you can be on the far left, a homozygote, so both of your genes code for the methionine version, or you can be a homozygote for valine, in which both of your genes code for the uh, valine version of CUMT. The valine homozygote on the far right is actually impaired in their ability to metabolize dopamine. And look at that. On the far right, the carriers of the val-val homozygote status of CUMT have about a um, seven-fold increased risk of schizophrenia if they were uh, cannabis users versus non-users. Um, so that is genetic evidence to implicate um, that dopamine signaling uh, is perhaps a pathway to a schizophrenia uh, condition. Okay, so those are mechanisms and association um, exists. So here are some association data, uh, as well as weaving in the dose response data. So first of all, we've, it's been fairly consistently observed that amongst cannabis users who get schizophrenia, that schizophrenia has an earlier age of onset. So cannabis use appears to accelerate the onset of schizophrenia, making it occur earlier in life. Um, and there seems to be an exposure response relationship as well. Um, the, the degree of earlier onset can range from between one to three years for average potency use uh, versus up to a six year earlier age of onset for people who are using high potency cannabis. Uh, so the stronger the dose, the more pronounced the early onset effect. Um, there's also just a straight up dose response or exposure risk relationship as well. Uh, this is a nice graph from a meta-analysis. Each of these lines of different colors represents the results from a different independent study. Um, on the x-axis, we see from left to right, increasing cannabis exposure. On the y-axis, from bottom to top, we see higher and higher numbers, for, uh, numbers of the odds ratio. So higher odds ratio means greater likelihood of schizophrenia. Um, and in all these curves, they bend up. Um, and in the, the purple one uh, by Degenhardt, that odds ratio it is like about seven. Uh, that correspond to a 700% increase in risk in that study. Um, different studies, different methods, different results, but all of them have the same trend. The higher the exposure, the greater the, um, the added risk of schizophrenia. So we have a mechanism whereby cannabis exposure can cause schizophrenia, and we have evidence of a re of relationship between degree of exposure and worsening of or, or acceleration of schizophrenia onset or increasing of risk. Uh, I think clinicians who work with people with schizophrenia have seen this firsthand again and again, uh, but what we see clinically has been validated by this study from 2016 in the UK. It involved 2,000 individuals with an initial episode of schizophrenia. Uh, they found that about half of their sample were cannabis users. We find in Ohio amongst first episode clinics that that's about our observed prevalence as well. Um, and in this study, they found that the cannabis-using 
subgroup of people with a first episode of schizophrenia had more frequent hospitalizations, more frequent involuntary treatment, and concerningly, um, higher rates of polypharmacy or med switching, which are proxies for treatment resistance. Um, this form of schizophrenia seems to be less responsive to the usual treatments, which might be expected if, in fact, the pathway to this form of schizophrenia is an inflammatory pathway through anandamide suppression uh, versus a straight up dopamine pathway. Um, so, altogether, um, we have several lines of evidence that should raise a bright red flag or at least a yellow caution flag around the uh, full progress to full legalization and full access without question in our country. Uh, it's also been seen that the, from all these observations that the worst or the highest risk pattern of use is beginning to smoke or to use marijuana as a teenager and continuing on a regular basis for a course of years. Um, and true, there are no, well, I'll point out, there are no studies that address neurological safety for multi-year uh, regular use of cannabis. If there are, please email me, call me, let me know if I'm wrong, and I'll retract the statement. But as far as I can see, we have no prospective data, um, even retrospective data, that give good information about neurological safety for multi-year exposure of regular use, not occasional use, uh, and specifically, or worse and worse, worsely, Firstly, we don't have uh, data when that uh, regular use begins in adolescence or early adulthood. Um, and I point that out because to the this is going to be on the internet, so I'm sure people are watching with a critical eye. So those of you who are you know cannabis legalization advocates, and I count myself among you, um, criticizing risky data doesn't make something safe. Uh, so, yeah, epidemiologic data has its weaknesses. All of the studies I said, I'll show you, have their limitations. That's the way science works. But I ask for the pro-safety advocates, where are your studies that say that when you start adolescent, when you start cannabis as a 19-year-old or a 16-year-old, and you use it daily for two years, that that's a completely safe thing for your brain. Um, and I would say that that's the, that's the debate that we should be having on this on this topic. And the reason I have a, added sarcasm to this lecture is because I would love it if I don't see you, dear viewer, in my clinic sometime soon. I've seen enough cases of kids and adults with schizophrenia who shouldn't have schizophrenia, um, and I believe wouldn't have it were it not for their uh, buying into this belief that we have found the medical equivalent of the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, a purely medicinal and benevolent substance with no harm. Uh, nature doesn't quite work that way. So that's the end of my um, unprepared comments. So we'll stop the recording now and we'll go to introduction.